Warning. You've reached on the box with great comfort and are now in a biblical truth zone. Place all questions about theology, current events, and evangelism on the box where they'll be weighed against the truth of God's Word. Ready your hearts and minds. You're about to be inspired and equipped to fulfill the Great Commission. Programming to engage in five, four, three, two, one. Alas, friends, we have survived another torturous weekend without you, and yet divine providence hath brought us together again with thee. <laughs> Ray, let me ask you this, seriously. So seriously, why in the world are there people who switch into Old English when they pray? <laughs> it's, it's tradition. We're traditional creatures, and uh, they, they, but it, they help with it not. <laughs> but is it, is it a concept that, like, no, it's, it's more it's, reverent, God hears yeah, them? Yeah, it is in, in people's minds because... For years and years, up until probably the 60s, all we had was the King James Version. Right. And then in came the Living Bible, which means you can talk proper, <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> and, and contemporarily. But uh, a lot of people are just stuck, and, and they've learned King James English, and, and you know. Uh, yeah. The, 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 it's just, I've, I've seen people do it, and they'll go from an immediate switch, oh, thou heavenly fall, though. Yeah, he know. that hath the Son hath life. It's just something you learn right. from the King James, and it just takes a while to make it into has. Yeah. But what we put out our comfortable version of the Evidence Bible, and we Whether took all the thsts <laughs> and made them <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing, You man. hear voices? Yeah, I, I do hear, hear voices. voices. What's going on here? We're hearing voices. Mm. So, friends, like I said, it's good to be back together again. Mark, do you ever speak in old English when you pray, being a descendant of Joseph Smith? No. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate your help. <laughs> nay, right? That, that should have been nay. nay. Yeah, we would have thrown in some oats if you had said uh, nay. Well, we hope you all had a wonderful weekend. We did, a busy one. We will give you a weekend debrief in just a little bit, but we're going to go ahead and jump into the hot topic of the day. We're going to be talking about Hugh Hefner. We're going to be talking about... Who? Uh, <laughs> who? <laughs> who, Hefner? We're going to talk about pornography. We're going to talk about the issue of lust and hopefully give you a little bit of insight on how to deal with it. All right. This is from Ray's book, What Hollywood Believes, and this is dealing with Hugh Hefner. Wow, he was born 1926. How mm -hmm. old would that make him, Ray? I don't know. <laughs> uh, pr I think about 86, 87. Is yeah, that up there? 87. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. All right. Hugh Hefner's life philosophy began in his youth. I was a very idealistic, very romantic kid in a very typical Midwestern Methodist repressed home. Boy, that's a mouthful. He said that he later discovered how organized religion degraded the outlook of both men and women. According to Hefner, if a man has a right to find God in his own way, he has a right to go to the devil in his own way also. Religious leaders can attempt to persuade us of correctness of their beliefs. They have this right, and indeed it is expected of them. They have no right, however, to attempt in any way to force their beliefs on others, as he forces his belief on others on what they can force on others. When asked if he feared death, Hefner answered, I'm very comfortable with the nature of life and death and that we come to an end. What's most difficult to imagine is that those dreams and early yearnings and desires of childhood and adolescence will also disappear. But who knows? Maybe you become part of the eternal whatever. Now, Ray, you're Hugh Hefner's age. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. I just can't resist. Yeah, these. yeah, can. But, Ray, um, you <laughs> he's proving <laughs> it, folks. But, Ray, um, he, he's, he's really become an icon. He is. He's an American hero. He led the charge. Mm. But one thing I noticed, he, ha he was a romantic kid. Right. I've never heard that <laughs> point before. He had raging hormones. He was red-blooded and lust-filled as a teenager. Not a romantic kid. I love how he puts a nice positive spin on lust. Oh, absolutely. Romantic. Ran you know, romantic this, kid. This chivalrous guy, you know. <laughs> but uh, when you were growing up, Ray, was he, that, I mean, you know, back in the 60s and 70s and, and so forth, um, was there a resistance to him and his philosophy? Or oh, not at all, but they, they'd take dirty magazines and shrink wrap them and put them where kids can't get them. I don't think they do that now. No. There, there were magazines that were around before he, he was a mate. Roman Catholic aunt used to have magazines all around the house when I'd visit her. Wow. And yeah, and, and, and uh, as a little kid, I, I was subject to things I shouldn't have seen. Right. It was just part of, 
part of the culture, I guess. But um, things have got far worse, and then it was quite. It is quite. It was quite tame then compared to what is out there now. Right. But he led the charge for liberation against Victorian values. And really, I wouldn't like to be in Hugh Hefner's shoes on Judgment Day. You think of all the marriages that have been destroyed because, right. of, because of him and his liberating man. Think of the sexually transmitted diseases that are out there, something like uh, 20 million cases, new cases each year right. uh, in the U.S. 20 wow. million. Um, and, and, and all the people are going to end up in hell because yeah. of him causing men to have access to instant sin. Right. Yeah. And... Uh, you know, he lounges around in his robe and his slippers. and Does he ever get dressed? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I've never, I don't think I've ever seen the guy in normal clothes. But, but it really is tragic. And, uh, you know, we, we make light of some aspects of this that, that you know, are, are tragically um, humorous in one sense. But in another sense, the, the, the tragedy is, is, is huge. And so uh, pornography, as you know, friends, has had a grip on so many people, especially now with kids. Mm. Again, you know, when, when before the age of the internet, you had to go and acquire a magazine or something physical. Yes. You know, you had to try to convince a, a store person if you're underage to let you buy a magazine or whatever, or steal it. Or, but now, at the click of a button, kids have access to it. Yeah. You know? There are probably maybe some atheists out there watching and, and some people that aren't Christians saying, what's, what's all the fuss? Right. This is just, you should have the liberty to look mm. at stuff that gives you pleasure. But we're not maintaining that pornography is detrimental to society. It gives a lot of pleasure to a lot of people. That's why it's such a, a, a I think it's a trillion dollar industry, not just billion. Right. Worldwide, people get pleasure from it. But we know that the Bible says, in God's eyes, lust is the same as adultery. Jesus said, whoever looks upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery already with her in his heart. And if, you, if you've committed adultery in your heart, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And that horrifies us. Right. And you know, we see there's pleasure in it, but lust brings forth uh, sin. What sin, what's conceived, brings forth death. Yeah. And so uh, a lot of things uh, give us pleasure, but it doesn't make them right. Yeah. Very important to remember, and that's the justification the world uses. It feels good. Do it. Yeah. But Mark, uh, I'd <coughs> love for you to speak to uh, the, the harmful and destructive aspects of pornography. Well, you know, porn is all over the place. It's a $10 billion a year industry, and that's in the United States alone. And that does not include uh, soft porn or rated R films that you may see down at the movie theater or late night movies that may come on uh, uh, the movie channels that are uh, uh, just out of the place. So, you know, the Bible says, do not lust in your heart after her beauty or let her captivate you with her eyes. You know, porn not only drives you into lust and captivates you, but it warps the very things that you think about concerning all things. Every woman you come in contact, you begin to think of her as a thing, as an object. Uh, you begin to think and do things that you wouldn't normally do in the presence of anybody else. We, we need to be absolutely careful with that. Um, it reconditions our mind, and we begin to see through perverted lenses. And let me right. answer your question specifically here with a couple things that Alan had thrown towards my desk before we came on the show here. And it, they really are um, top-notch here on a couple ways that porn begins to uh, wreck us. It begins to kill our walk with God. You know, we know that God hates sin, you know, and you can't serve two masters. You'll either love the one or you'll hate the other. So if you're serving God, you're going to begin to hate sin, and that would include pornography. But if you're giving yourself over to pornography and you've got that wandering eye and you don't bounce over to away for, towards something, and I think you can talk about that a little bit later with Steve Arterburn's book, great book, uh, which I would imagine you're going to get into, you're, you're going to wreak havoc upon your soul. Because when you begin to give into the temptations and the lusts of the heart, you won't be satisfied with anything other than those things. And the only thing that is going to ensue after that is death. Right. Uh, porn tricks you into seeing sex as just a physical act. You know, sex is more than just skin on skin. It's extremely spiritual, and it actually makes two people become one person, according to Scripture. Porn feeds you the wrong image of the opposite sex, or nowadays, uh, the same sex. There's so much uh, pornography that is available to people, we begin to focus on the outward instead of the inward. So we need to be careful in that. Uh, porn lowers, finally, your ability to love. You know, lust is the opposite of love. Love protects. Lust steals. When you water lust with porn, it'll send its roots deep down into your heart and choke the love away. Um, 
I remember one preacher once saying, and I, and I read it here, that lust is a lot like a stick of dynamite in the hands of an individual. He's mesmerized by the flickering wick. He holds onto it tight. It dazzles him, and it gives him a great sense of wonder and pleasure. But if he doesn't get rid of it quick, it's going to be the end of him. You have to kill lust before it kills you. And the Bible says this, lays this wisdom before us when it comes to us. It says, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right. Think about things that are pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Um, You know, we need to, I guess, give ourselves a little test to see where we are at when it comes to lustful thoughts. If it arouses you, you need to ditch it. It's, It's that simple. If you find some arousal in the midst of it, you need to get rid of it. You know, who was it? Was it John Wesley's mom who said, I don't care how... Uh, spiritual in and of itself, it may be, if it doesn't drive you closer to the Lord, it's sin to that individual. You think about that. We begin to entertain lustful thoughts and these desires that come inside of our mind. What do we do with those things? We can't stop a bird from flying over our head, but we can prevent him from making a nest in our hair. Right. So we need to be careful when those thoughts, when those billboards, when those commercials come our way. I remember I was opening our preaching one time. And I had asked this individual, is pornography right or wrong? And with great confidence and conviction, he said, well, pornography is 100% okay. It's, it's a, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. And my resort back to him was, at what age would you like your precious little daughter to get involved in that noble profession? Wow. <laughs> well, there was a moment of silence that kind of came over the crowd and these gasps. When you begin to think about it, That when we grab a hold of our worldview and we take it to its logical conclusion, there are consequences to our actions. Mm. We begin to think, well, nobody knows about this. I entertain this thought when nobody's around. Nobody's thinking. I'm in my closet. I'm in my room. I'm in my shower. We have thoughts and actions that will reverberate on into forever, on into eternity. You sow a thought, you're going to reap an action. You sow an action, you reap a habit. You sow a habit, you reap a character, you reap a character, you're going to reap a destiny. You can make no mistakes about it, that we need to be killing sin or sin will be killing us. And if you're a male, this is the number one thing that plagues you. This is the number one question, I was just told, that is hit home towards youth leaders. How do I overcome lustful thoughts? I have these things that come my way. This was inside the chat room just moments ago. What are some positive things that I can do to run away from lustful thoughts? And we're going to talk about that here on the show. And if these are questions that you have, you've actually come to the right place. Boy, you know, Satan has such a way of taking the wonderful things that God creates and designs oh, yes. and twisting them. Yeah. You know, sex is a wonderful thing. I have to often remind people, especially if I'm doing marital counseling or dealing with people that have had struggles with with the whole issue of of sexual intimacy, that it was God's idea. (laughs) He designed it. He created it. It's beautiful. And if you need any evidence for how wonderful it is, just look at the amazing human beings that come about because of it, you know? Mm -hmm. So Satan has a way of tainting it and twisting it, and it's the only way some people see it. But Ray, if you were to give someone one strong piece of advice and wisdom of how to deal with this, how, how to have victory over pornography and lust, what would it be? It would be to cultivate the fear of God in your life. Um, if you look at pornography, I've got some advice to you. Take it to church and read it during a worship service. You say, oh. I could never do that. Wow. So why not? Well, I'm in the presence of God. Hmm. Well, there's something wrong with theology. God is omnipresent. He right. doesn't dwell in buildings made with hands. Yeah, right. The church is not the building. It's the people, and God dwells everywhere and sees everything. The eyes of the Lord in every place, beholding the evil and the good. So if you wouldn't read or look at pornography in the presence of God in a worship service, don't do it in the presence of God in your bedroom. Right. Yeah. And so if you cultivate the fear of God, it's the best, uh, best thing you can do for yourself. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it'll keep you. It'll keep you from evil. You know, lust, is a, as Mark was saying, it's, it's kind of like a fire. A fire will go out if you don't feed it. Stop feeding the fire. Stop thinking. And, and <clears throat> some uh, Mark was saying how uh, the number one question is, how do I control lustful thoughts? Well, this is something I've done. Pray a positive prayer when you get a negative thought, whether it be a lustful thought, whether it be a bitter, hateful thought, something you don't want. 
Every, write down the most positive prayer you can think of. Lord, please use me. Open up doors. Give me wisdom. Make me bold. Give me a concern for the lost. Please, uh, please speak through me to others. And the most positive prayer you can think of, write it down, memorize it. And then when a lustful thought comes, pray that positive prayer. So a negative turns a positive on him. It's like an alarm bell. Pray that positive prayer. And you'll find the enemy will back off because this isn't just your own heart. It's the enemy. If you're a Christian, you wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. So see it as a spiritual battle and do yourself the biggest favor you could ever do, cultivate the fear of God. And the way to do that is read Proverbs chapter 1 and chapter 2. Right. If you get understanding, if you get knowledge, then you'll know the fear of the Lord. So study scripture as to what God is like. See that when he gave his law, the Ten Commandments, so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. This is when God appeared to Moses and with a smile on his face, gave his commandments to Moses and Moses just about died in terror. Right. And the children of Israel said, don't let God speak lest we die just by his voice. They heard his voice in the New Testament. They thought it thundered. And this is what it wasn't when God is angry and the day is going to come when he manifests his fury against humanity and you don't want to be guilty on that day and if you're feeding yourself with sinful thoughts. You are committing adultery in your heart every single time you lust and you're storing up God's wrath that it be revealed in the day of wrath. And I hope that puts the fear of God on you. Wow. Boy, we are experts at living in the shadow of the fear of man. Yeah. Because there are so many things that we would never do in the presence of other people. Yeah. yeah. I mean, imagine your pastor That's and so all true. of your close friends just coming in your room and just standing there. You're going to sit there and look at pornography in front of them? Oh, I'd never do that. We do that in the presence of of a holy living God if, if we're a person that does that sort of thing. And that's tragic. And so you've got to cultivate, like Ray's saying, the fear of God in your heart. That's, that's the root, really. That's the foundation. But then there are other practical things that you can do that would help you. Hmm. You know, look, if, if you're indiscriminately watching television, just uh, camping out on things because they're funny or they're cool or someone recommended them, these things are, are entering your heart and mind. This is, this is really giving the enemy... Uh, you know, ammunition to use against you. You don't give your enemy ammunition to use against you. You want to withhold that from them. You know, um, you want to be wise enough to be able to build a habit of just turning away when, when you see something that stirs lust in your heart. And that can become a habit. You know, the more you starve yourself in that area, uh, the, the more you're going to have victory over it because you're not going to be prone to just give in. You know, TiVo has really helped with me because one thing, I'd watch wholesome programs with Sue, and the advertisements in the middle were just filled with lust. Right. And, and they, come, they come when you're least expecting them. You think, here's an advert for uh, hamburgers. That's fine. <laughs> wow, oh, you boy. get an image you just don't want. And uh, TiVo means you, you can record a program and just zoom through those advertisements so fast right. you don't see them. And yeah. that, I, I love doing that. Absolutely. And also getting a filter on your computer, mm -hmm. uh, you know, getting, uh, getting uh, you know, um, accountable with other people that, that are going to help to hold you up in that area of your life. Um, you know, getting to a place where you say, you know what, maybe I'm going to cut television out or whatever, yeah. whatever you need to do. You know, Mark, you could speak to that. How important is it for people to get proactive and stop making excuses? You know, well, you have to stop making excuses because life's almost over. It doesn't matter how old or how young you are, how smart what kind of degrees you have, how many letters behind your name. Life's almost over for each one of us. And 100 years from now, I dare to say, none of us are going to be here. You know, we begin to think of pornography and lust as mainly a, a man issue, but really it's not. It's a female issue as well. The fastest growing book series of all time is what? Fifty Shades of Grey. I, I don't know too much about it. I just pulled it up here on Wikipedia. But it's a 2011 erotic romance novel by British author E.L. James, and it's the first installment of the Fifty Shades trilogy that traces the deepening relationship between two different people. There's many different sorts of sexual escapades apparently that happen here, but 70 million, 70 million, I, 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 I can't believe this, 70 million copies worldwide with book rights having been sold in 37 countries, and the audience are females. Wow. Not males. It's for the yeah. females. So 70 million females not being aroused by the eyes, but by the ears or by the eyes in a different way, by what they read. We, we, we can't begin to think that it's not happening in my church. It's not happening in my family or amongst my friends. We need to be proactive and we need to have accountability. Yeah. Accountability is a great thing. You don't have accountability because you have a problem with it. If you don't have a problem with it, you need to have accountability. 
I remember one time Ray was giving a, uh, a plea on, during an altar call of some, some degree, and people are saying, you need to come to the altar right now. If you have a problem with pornography, you need to come to the altar now. If you don't have a problem with pornography, that's your problem. You have no problem with it. You continually uh, soak it up like a sponge does water. You need to come to the altar mm -hmm. now. So we need to get on the offense when it comes to things of this nature. Absolutely. And I th good, good points, Mark. And I also think women need to understand that men are microwaves. They're not conventional ovens. They heat up right. real quick. So you've got to dress appropriately. And I'm not saying run around a, what is that, burka? <laughs> you know, like a sleeping right. bag looking out the top with right. you know, holes for your feet. But I'm saying just be, just be sensitive to what yeah. men are like. Yeah. And, uh, because at Hunting the Beach, Scotty and I, we have a problem there. Every Saturday there's girls running around in bits of string. And, uh, and, and for, for guys, it's a problem. Yeah. 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 Sensitivity on the part of parents with their children, their young daughters, and what you're training them to wear and teaching them the way that men work. Men have the accountability before God. They have no excuse whatsoever. And yet, women are called to be modest, and you can help create an atmosphere, especially for you Christian women, for your brothers, so that they don't stumble and struggle with that. Yeah. You know? But uh, it's, it's so important to, to recognize that this is a huge problem, and we need to really be proactive. We need to lift each other up as, as believers and, and uh, cry out to God for And also realize that, that sin isn't sin until you give yourself to it. Yeah. Jesus was tempted in all points as we are. Right. And no doubt he looked at women, uh, but he didn't sin. He was without sin. Right. And so uh, it's the, the bouncing of the eyes that Mark was talking about. When you look at an image, you just bounce away from it or do what I do because I've had laser surgery. Uh, when I close my left eye, my right eye just goes to a blur, <laughs> but I'm afraid of getting slapped by a woman. When I look at them, I'll go like that. I think I'm, I'm oh boy, them. creating another problem and trying to avoid <laughs> one. But, you know, um, yeah, and, uh, and realizing that, yeah, temptation is not sin. Because sometimes what happens is the panic mm -hmm. can intensify the That's problem with lust. Oh, I can't think about it. Don't think of a pink elephant. Don't think of a pink <laughs> elephant. Don't think of a pink elephant. You know, that's all you're going to do. So that's recognizing, true. as Mark cited earlier, that, look, birds are going to fly over your head. You can't help that. But you could keep them from nesting in your hair. We all know the difference between having a resistance, even though the thoughts are still coming and arrows of the enemy are being yeah. shot at us, and letting go of the reins and just giving in and going with it. We all know the difference. Yeah. And so there are times when, you know, what you can do is simply just pray, hey, Lord, you know my heart, you know my desire. I want to honor you in this. Please guard me from the enemy. And then move forward. It comes back again. Just pay it no attention. Just keep going. Yeah, whatever. Before you know it, it's right. gone. You know, and so... Or... You could think of pink elephants, and that would leave no room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, start oh. hollering. Don't think of a pink elephant. They're really big. <laughs> oh, boy. So anyhow, um, hopefully that's given you a little bit of uh, insight before. yeah, and, and some clarity. So all right, we're going to now go to the weekend outreach debrief. Ray, how was Huntington? Oh, it was good. Yeah, yeah. we've got some video to look at. Okay. Picture's worth a thousand words. Let's roll it. So here we are, uh, hunting the beach. Scotty, what were you saying? Oh, there's tents and there's atheists here today. And there's, and I said, anything else I need to know about? <laughs> because I was feeling this boot in my chest, high anxiety. Now, a lot of people don't know that I smoked for 30 years. So I said to Ray, I need a cigarette. <laughs> yes, yeah, the usual uh, little nerves before we preach, but it makes us pray. So. Uh, yeah, there's a little bit of wind, quite a few people around. You're blocking and, uh, your way, mister. Yeah, but you are Mr. Patient, it wouldn't worry you at all, because we're on camera, Scotty. Uh, so, the atheists are here today, they're going to meet us, and we're very excited to see them. Well, there's the guys doing the acrobats, there's a clown there. We're set up, there's quite a lot of people around. And over here, we've got our atheist friends. So, we'll go and say hello to them. <laughs> How are we doing, guys? I'm Mike, Lisa. God bless you. Thank you. What did you say? <laughs> I'm just kidding. God bless you. I'm just kidding. Yeah, no. Take care of Ray. Good to see you guys. You gonna come across and heckle us? Got any hecklers with you guys? Bruce, are you gonna heckle us? Well, that guy kind of yelled at us earlier. It's mutually appropriate, though. That's great. Questions is Mike. Okay, Mike the atheist just heckled me for about 40 minutes. Bruce the atheist came over, and, and Mike's a nice guy. And now Scotty's talking. And realize that all of this that is around the world did not come from nothing. 
That is foolishness. It isn't. It isn't reasonable. It isn't coherent. Actually, now you want to explain it to me. That's my. That's my premise. Okay. My turn. It's actually you that believes that everything came from nothing because you believe that once there at once there was nothing except this deity and then the deity just went poof and then there was everything. So, so what do you mean except? So you do believe that everything came from nothing. What do you mean except? What do I mean except? You said there was nothing except, except. this deity. Except. Well, it's been a good news. I went over and chatted with my atheist friends over there and uh, they asked for a copy of the Genius DVD, which is very encouraging. Scott is still preaching away to an atheist who's up there heckling them. I think we've had an atheist, atheist overload to take. How cool is that? Amophobia is the fear of, and I'm going to give you a hint, has to do with relationship. Commitment. It's not love. It's not commitment. Before we preach the gospel again. What is gamophobia the fear of? This is actually funny. The guy over there is telling his friend the wrong answers. He's yelling them out to his friend, thinking he's getting them right. Paris in the spring. And the second one. Bird in the hand. And the third one. Once in a lifetime. Get my hand, he got them all wrong. Oh. Yeah. You're missing the I want you to the see your own mistake, so read each word that I point to, okay? What's that word? Paris. In the does. <laughs> that cameraman moves too fast. It's, what is it, some squirrel? Oh, you know, Ray, I, I'm, seriously, I'm absolutely mystified. These guys have big banners. They've got signs. They're expending time, energy, resources yeah. to come down there and <laughs> speak against a God they don't believe exists. Yeah, they uh, must secretly envy us because we've got something to live for. They haven't. Yeah, unreal. You know? All right, friends. Mark, take us to the tool of the day, please. Yeah, you know, uh, Todd Friel has the city slain the dragon. No more strategies, no more band-aids. This city contains the information you need to never fall into the temptation of pornography again. Um, what will it take, it says on the back. What do you need to hear that you'll never look at another forbidden image again? What do you need to do so that you'll never go to that dirty place again? We believe this city contains two principles that every man needs to hear to slay the dragon of pornography. What do you have to lose, it goes on to say, except your job, your marriage, your children, wow. your soul. Very powerful. It contains two principles. You don't want to miss it. It's available at livingwaters.com. So there it is. There's our issue, dealing with pornography and lust. We hope that was some benefit to you. God bless you. We hope to see you tomorrow with On the Box. Have a great night. For questions about On the Box with Ray Comfort or to submit questions for future shows, please email onthebox at livingwaters.com. That's on the box at livingwaters.com. On the box with Ray Comfort is an outreach of Living Waters. For more resources to inspire and equip you to fulfill the Great Commission, check out livingwaters.com or call toll free 1 800 437 1893. Now go and preach the gospel.